I've always been a uh, huge. Well, I, it stemmed back. I'm, I'm actually the youngest of seven kids. So, uh, and there were five girls. My brother was the oldest, and I was the youngest. And there were five girls in between. So I had to room with my brother, much to his chagrin, I'm sure. And he was 14 years older than I. And so I got exposed to all the music he listened to. And there was something about, you know, when you're eight year old or so and you come running in your room with your buddies, you're playing guns or whatever around the house. And there's your brother sitting in front of the stereo, you know, with his legs crossed, listening to Cream. And I'm like, what's that sound? He's like, this is the greatest power trio in the history of man. Eric Clapton, Jack Bruce and Ginger. But you're like, whoa, you know, and, and just from there on in, I mean, I never get tired of, um, you know, I like all of Clapton's eras, but I think like like most people, like the Cream era, uh, up through Derek and the Dominoes is really my favorite, although I still own all the other stuff and I'm a fan of that as well. But it's interesting because it never gets old. It's like, you know, especially like in Cream, I know he would bemoan the fact of, oh, you know, back then I was just playing too much and repeating stuff. It's like, yeah, but you, you said new things every time that you use those words. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's like, like the other day I'm driving in the car and I got my, my phone on shuffle and that live cream volume two version of stepping out comes on. And I'm just like, Oh my God, this is just the greatest stuff. <laughs> I'd never get tired of listening to it. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a weird thing. And you wonder how much of that is just, you know, our first listening to it back then and that kind of childhood fascination or is it just really that good <laughs> you know what i mean oh, yeah yeah well nothing can uh replace the mo you know that moment when you hear music it, it, you know that i mean it's all about that and i know scientists say that you know from age like 10 to 14 that's it whatever music you like during that age period, that that's what you're going to take through for the rest of your life, you know. Interesting. And and that has to do with you know hormones and brain development and everything. And um, so that's you know all of that is cool, and it's important to note that that uh, again it goes back to the idea that we're it's really not about demonstration because when you're at that age, you, like you, the story you told, you're eight years old, and you walk in, you're watching your brother having a moment with a cream record. Uh, it didn't cross your mind that maybe Clapton could have used his other fingers right. for that one. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why didn't he use his third finger? Come on. So, I mean, it, it just, again, it reminds you as a musician, it's really about the music. I mean, it sounds trite, but uh, how often do musicians forget that? And they go up there and they bring all that baggage with them on stage and they're like, I practice this and I'm going to show it to you, you know? Right, exactly. <laughs> like, it doesn't work. And the other side of that is it, it, it kind of goes back to a, co a collection of things that Warhol was saying once when they were asking him about art and, and, and uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing him saying, you know, don't listen to what other people think. Just go while they're arguing about whether what you've done is good or not. Just keep making more. Right. right. So in the same way, we don't know the effect of our music on people. You have no idea the state of mind somebody is in, what what they're if they're in the exaltation, if they're in the saddest spot in their life, and your song comes on, and it means something to them, you know, right? And it's got they're not thinking, they're not rating us, you know what I mean? Right. They're just sitting there, a human being. They need music. To, to be with them and there it is there's this song and it'll it stays with them like that and that something that musicians again need to respect and understand and and grapple with that that's what we're doing you know that's that's how people use us so to speak you know what i mean right like if we if we made picks right we would be all about listening to our customers what do they want you know what are we doing wrong with this pick that they, they don't like and how do we make it better you know right. so because it's art of course we don't want to just cater to the whim they know what they like but they don't want to be asked to design the, the music you know what i mean right so they're, they're expecting us to just sort of surprise them all the time with the right thing the right mood at the right time you know uh, this fascinates me you know and that's yeah. why when i'm sitting here in this room i write music i record demos and then I sit back and I go, okay, that might be the best, that might be the worst thing I've ever written, but it's not for me to decide. And like um, on the other side of the door is this big board 
and on it is 12 songs that I've written for my live band because I decided we do we would record two albums this year while we're all stuck at home. And the instrumentals that I wrote for the for album number one are so different, but I didn't discriminate. I didn't say like, how's that going to fit in, you know, after summer song or flying in a blue dream or something like that. I just right. said, this, this is who I am. This is what I wrote. Uh, and I'm just going to give it to the guys and see what they think. And everyone is reacting the same way remotely. They're adding their tracks and we're, we're slowly building, uh, this album. And, uh, every time someone comes into this room and they listen to a track, I can tell that they're reacting. Pure. And, and, and again, it, it illustrates to me that even though I'm supposed to practice, ultimately I don't want anybody to hear that. I don't want them to be reminded of any of my practicing of any of my issues with fingertips or, sure. <laughs> or, or, you know, master volumes or signal chain or whatever, you know, uh, I just want them to hear the music and be touched by it. You know? Well, I'll tell you what I, uh, last night I listened, uh, through a shapeshifter from top to bottom and, uh, it's, it's awesome. And it, <laughs> what, what was, you know, I mean, this is kind of a stupid, weird question, but, um, it's very visual music. You know what I mean? And I guess all music is to an extent, but, it's like I was having, it's like every tune put me in a certain place. And sometimes I'd go to a certain place. And then just the way that, you know, it was mixed, you know, there's just, it's like I've, you can get amongst it. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, oh, this little thing is chirping over here. And this is there, oh, here comes this guitar over here. You know what I mean? It was just, it was a, uh, it was a cool experience to listen to and be transported someplace. But at the same time, when I got done with it, I was like, well, how hard must it be? I mean, you've, you know, I mean, let's be honest, you're, um, probably the most successful instrumental guitarist in the history of man or beast. And, beast. And, and you get to the point where it's like, what motivates you to make another record? And how do you make another record where it's still, it's respectful of what you've done in the past, uh, but is not pimping what you've done in the past, but is still fresh and still moving forward uh, I guess, you know, in the previous things we've been talking about, it kind of explains why. But I mean, it's it's just, um, I, I let's just say I'm a fan. I mean, it, it was, Thank it's you. an awesome record. And and to keep motivated at this point in your career, I mean, what what keeps you motivated? What are your, your goals for the, um, for the future? Or is it just about, look, I just do what's in the moment. I like to create music. And, or, or are you systematical of, okay, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. And for the next period of time this is what i want to get done because you've done let's be honest you've done it all you've played with iconic stars you yourself are as about as iconic as it gets as a um as an artist in your genre what's next what what keeps you um motivated maintain uh, you just want to keep on going yeah out? that looks good in the camera i like that pow pow, pow. like 3D, right? We're streaming in 3D. That's good. <laughs> uh, I I can't help it. I just have to write music. I have to play music for people. I have no explanation for it. No excuse. I do know that it's just something that I have to do. It's like with drawing and painting. Uh, I just have to do it. So I don't argue with that impulse. Um, it's important to note that you know, your your questions are really well aimed at at the um, at the situation I find myself in just about every two years because I don't notice it myself, but people come at me like that. Journalists always ask, no matter how recent you've delivered something brand new, they always want to know what's next. You know, and uh, I I find it very interesting, uh, but it also is a little. So into into my psyche, which is, it is true that once I finish a record, I feel compelled to go in the other direction. If I just walked off a right field, I want to go to left field right away. I just want something different. So I know that's just part of my nature. But if we step back and we go, well, how you know how does that get you from the beginning of a album idea all the way to being in the studio and delivering, right? So I'm signed to Sony Legacy. So we have a schedule, we have a budget, we have a really talented team of people who are just waiting to help me anytime 
I, I need some help putting stuff together. In this particular case, I thought, okay, I need to pull the rug out. You know, I mean, that's how you get yourself to play differently. You pick up the other guitar, you plug into the other amp, you get rid of the familiar things that would sort of lead you towards playing the same riffs, writing the same kinds of songs. And you just say, okay, I'm going to put myself in an environment where I just have to react to what's happening around me. So a couple of things happened that were really funny. I got this text from Kenny because we were on the road last year uh, with the experience Hendrix. And he was talking about the set list. And then he just said, oh, by the way, just left Jim Scott's place. Uh, pliers in Valencia. What a great guy, amazing engineer, what a great guy. And then he went on texting about, you know, the upcoming uh, leg of the tour. And I thought to myself, you know, Jim Scott, why would he ever do a Joe Satriani record, you know? And I thought, I should just call the guy up. And, you know, I know he's like, you know, Tom Petty and Rage Against the Machine and all this stuff. And he's just got, he's had so many number one records and, and Grammys and everything, and I thought, but maybe he's just waiting for me to call. Yeah, <laughs> he's sitting there going, "When's Joe gonna call me?" You know. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, you know, a couple of weeks later, uh, Rubina and I are down there. We're visiting his studio, which is like a wonderland. It's just a crazy looking place, warehouse studio. And Jim is such a, a sweet guy, and I think he really understood what I was looking for because I said, "Look, I got these songs." Every song's going to be different. I want to be a different guitar player for every song. I'm not going to make this song like, you know, it's a math chord. Every song's got to sound math chord, you know, or all blues or all this or all that. I said, no, I'm going to be the one who changes. Every song's going to be different. And we're going to invite these musicians in that love that too. And I'm going to be asking them, you are that kind of a bass player on song number six, but on song number seven, I want you to be this kind of a bass player. And everyone, once we got together, Chris Chaney, uh, uh, and then uh, obviously Kenny Aronoff, uh, my friend Eric Codio uh, playing keyboards and editing with us, everyone got in that spirit as well as Jim Scott. And it was so much fun every day when we would start a new song that it would be totally fresh. New guitars, new amps. Uh, you know, new drum kit, new new attitude and everything. And this helped everybody feel uh, that the song was, as you said, like a whole world, like a little movie that was a whole new place to go to. Um, and, you know, some songs required just having no conception of the rest of the record. Like a song like Teardrops, it just, everybody needed to really think about uh, the the meaning of the song and just forget about the album and just think about the song and and no demonstrations of technique or anything like that you know what I mean just like right. the song and uh, so they were they were just every moment towards the end of the day when we knew we had to take they were great moments because everyone realized they had they had done the right thing they did something new they were happy what with their contribution and I, and I was overjoyed of course because I I was hearing my musical visions just come to life for the first time you know and uh and jim's mixing i mean yes nuggets beautiful little gems all over the place yes <laughs> he just ah oh, so great yeah and you play differently when you start to hear that take shape in the studio because you know when uh these days the way that we record because digital you think um different than the old days with, with the tape, you know, right? Um, where you really didn't know where mixing was going to take the song, but you kind of mix as you go in the digital world. And so it's, you start to react to it, you know, and you go, wow, I, I could use a Princeton for that track over there and we could use the 5150 over there and, there, and it can actually work, you know, right. whereas normally you would bring the two to the same session. You know what I mean? Right. But uh, it, it the, the way that Jim had everything, mixed and how he would layer things just it it made you appreciate uh the the wide open stereo mix and and every time that you don't duplicate something it gives you rhythmic freedom and everybody stayed clear of the kick drum and you know it was just like sure. it suddenly became uh a kind of mix where every time you hear it, you could focus in on, on some other part of somebody's instrument really aspect of the performance and 
very different from mixing in the ensemble feel, you know, where everyone has to play the same part perfectly. Right. <laughs> right. And it, then the mix becomes kind of flat. It's it's impressive and it has its 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 uh, pluses, but it's different. It's a different animal altogether. That wow. was the longest explanation ever. I loved so it. Gonna, I loved it. Editing that. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs>